great to be presenting here again. And I always like coming to these because while my work focuses on the environment, I'm always asked about the human health benefits of seafood, and now I feel like I'm much better educated. So um, I do really enjoy this event. Um, my talk is called Why the World Needs a New Wave of Food Production, Aquaculture's World and uh, Role in a World Affected by Climate Change. Actually, this was originally an op-ed that I wrote with two of my colleagues, Bill Dewey and Barton Seaver for the World Economic Forum. I've taken some liberties to try to uh, incorporate some of anecdotes from our work at the Nature Conservancy. I don't think Bill or Barton will mind too much, but B Barton, as folks know, has been involved with SMP uh, for a number of years and only appropriate that uh, this is being presented here as well. Um, a little bit about our organization, the Nature Conservancy, we're the world's, one of the world's largest environmental organizations, and we're really focused on three things, protecting oceans, lands, and water. That's been the historical mission of the Nature Conservancy and what you might know about us, but we're also focused on two other areas uh, that are big priorities for us, tackling climate change and providing food and water sustainably. And within that food priority, which is one of our newest priorities at TNC, is where our aquaculture work sits. Why are, we, why are we focusing so much on food production at the Nature Conservancy? Food production, one of the reasons, is food production accounts for about 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It also accounts for about 70% of habitat loss and 80% of the world's fresh, wa fresh water usage. It's really clear that we're gonna need to figure out ways of producing food in much smarter ways for the environment, particularly as the demand for food increases. The demand for food is projected to increase by about 60% by the year 2050. But we also know, and this is a fact, that emissions are going to need to be reduced by 45% by the year 2030, and we'll need to achieve net zero emissions by the year 2050 to achieve the targets laid out in the 2005 UN Paris Agreement talks. So what are we to do? Uh, huge pressure on our food system. I think aquaculture plays a pretty big role in this conversation. Uh, I'm gonna outline why that is. And there's a, a number of dimensions to this. I think there's five dimensions that I wanna cover. Uh, aquaculture's role in mitigating impacts and mitigating emissions. Aquaculture's role in sequestration, uh, some emerging science on that. Aquaculture's role in adaptation uh, for food systems, particularly in light of fisheries. Um, the industry's role in activism, and finally, on ocean observations. So I think if there's nothing else you take away from this, se se this session on planetary health, it's this slide, and Hugh talked about this as well. Um, aquaculture allows for the production of more food with less resources, and particularly carbon emissions. So compared to a pound of beef, it takes about a tenth of the carbon emissions to produce a pound of, a pound of seafood through aquaculture, a pound of fish. Uh, the same, similarly, uh, an order of magnitude, less land use, fresh water use, and feed conversion ratios are also less. Uh, the real winners here are actually these bivalves, these low trophic organisms that feed just nat on the natural productivity in the surrounding environment, about a hundredth of the carbon emissions of beef production. They don't require any feed, any fresh water, or really hardly any land at all to produce. And they're actually doing something good for the environment. They're filtering water, they're removing nutrients from our waterways. 60% of our waterways suffer from nutrient pollution. These animals can take that nutrient pollution out of the water uh, and provide a really healthy uh, form of animal protein. As we heard today, oysters, clams, mussels are one of the best things that we could be eating. Um, so, we're gonna need more aquaculture, right? We're gonna need more, it means we gotta eat more of the, the aquaculture products and seafood products, particularly the low trophic ones. It also means that governments need to be prioritizing as they're developing and thinking about that food, food future and that, that growth story that's going to occur in, in demand for seafood and prioritizing development of the aquaculture sector. Um, but it's not just enough to say, we should grow aquaculture because it's comparatively less and just stop there. You know, aquaculture can't rest on its laurels and just say, well, we're lower than everybody else. We are encouraging at TNC for everybody to do their part, right? This is an all hands on deck situation with climate. Uh, and aquaculture has to do its part to minimize its own emissions. And if you look at the comparative environmental footprint uh, in uh, carbon emissions footprint of different aquaculture sectors, it varies quite a bit. 
some are more than others, right? And some are higher than others. And those are perhaps the target first of um, the low-hanging fruit for reducing emissions. So here I'm displaying a chart of the carbon emissions budget of a typical shrimp producer in uh, the Southeast Asian context. And it's among the higher emissions profiles within the seafood sector, within the aquaculture sector, 12.3 12 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of shrimp. There's, we've done an analysis with Bain, Bain and Company to determine that it's actually possible to reduce the carbon emissions of shrimp farming by about 50% with a limited impact on the price, price to the end consumer and a li limited impact on the cost of operations. What does it take to do that? It's really two main steps. One is around feed. It's about better sourcing of feed, uh, particularly around soy. And it's also about better formulations of feed that are more optimized to, uh, towards climate. That may involve alternative proteins, things like the DSM and Veramara soil. Uh, these are part of the solution there as well. On farm, it's about intensifying production, uh, more precision technology, uh, getting more yield out of the same ponds. Uh, so it means aeration technologies, improved feeding practices, improved uh, water quality monitoring techniques to get more out of less resources. So with those interventions, we can actually drop the, these emissions quite significantly, and, but not mitigate at all. So if farmers want to do more to mitigate that, there's options, right? You can buy offsets on the open market. You can contribute to a local conservation project that you know, protects uh, natural infrastructure that supports and sequesters carbon, like mangroves. Uh, you might actually be able to do something with seaweed aquaculture as well, and I'll talk to that, to that in a second. So TNC right now is actually act trying to activate a project to make this real. We're working with some of the largest shrimp producers and some of the largest retailers in the U.S. with the goal of bringing a low-carbon shrimp product to the United States in the next year. Um, sequestration, okay. Does aquaculture sequester carbon? Uh, maybe. The question is, the answer is maybe. Uh, in the case of seaweed aquaculture, there is some good research emerging in this, in this space that seaweed may actually have the ability to sequester carbon. And there's a couple of pathways that are being explored. Uh, one is a, an open ocean, uh, the potential for sequestration in the deep sea. When you farm seaweed, some portion of the seaweed naturally breaks away and it may float away from the farm and sink to the bottom of the sea and get sequestered. There's another pathway in some of the nearshore seaweed farms, such as this one, where pieces of the seaweed may be, break away and serve as a blue carbon donor. So the carbon from these, the little pieces of seaweed break away and provide nutrients and basically fertilization for other blue carbon habitats like seagrass beds and mangrove forests. Um, so what's the potential here? My colleague, Holly Froelich uh, at University of California, Santa Barbara did an analysis and she projected that the seaweed aquaculture sector, if it were directed towards carbon dioxide removal and sequestration could offset the remaining emissions of the entire aquaculture sector. That's theoretical, right? So there is an opportunity there. Uh, the VCS uh, Vera carbon standard is working in the next two years to try to bring a carbon standard out for seaweed aquaculture uh, to help credibly credit uh, seaweed farms. Uh, we're excited for that. We're, we're working on that uh, together with them. This is a, a picture that was taken in Zanzibar. I, re, I was recently in Zan, Zanzibar earlier this summer. We work with a lot of uh, female sea, seaweed farmers in uh, Zanzibar and Pemba Islands. There's about 25,000 female seaweed farmers in that location. It's really, really important to livelihoods in that area. There's very few sources of income aside from fishing. Uh, it's a source of important uh, empowerment for these women in these communities. Uh, let me take you someplace else that we're doing work um, and help to show the role of aquaculture and climate adaptation. Uh, in the country of Palau, TNC has been working in Palau for over 30 years at this point. It was the first um, program that TNC had in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, this is one of the places on earth that has the highest incidence of, of consumption of fish, uh, more than almost anywhere else. The projections around climate change are showing that Palau is likely to lose about 35% of its skipjack tuna harvest as a result of these, these fish stocks shifting away. 
and the impacts of overfishing are showing themselves as well. Um, it's, a, it's a country that's already seeing shifts in its diet due to the lack of availability of fish, and as more processed foods have become available in Palau, um, these diet shifts have actually had significant social consequences. Palau has some of the highest incidences of non-communicable diseases anywhere. So the government really wants to develop aquaculture, right? Developing fresh foods and farming in Palau is less of an option. It's only got the land area about two and a half times the size of Washington, D.C. So aquaculture, they see as a big part of their future. So TNC has been working with them to develop a couple of different candidate species. We've been working on rabbit fish. We've been working on uh, milk fish. We've been working on giant clam. We've been working on building the regulatory structure to develop this industry in the right way. But this is you know, a challenge that's occurring time and time again in many locations uh, throughout the United States and around the world, whether it's you know, seeing black sea bass occur in the Gulf of Maine for the first time, or lobsters disappearing from the Long Island Sound. We know that climate change is gonna move fish stocks, and aquaculture can be a significant way of building uh, alternative sources of seafood supply in local communities that really need it, such as uh, Pacific Island developing states. Um, activism. So this picture on the bottom right is a guy by the name of Bill Mook. He's the CEO of Mook Sea Farms. He has the largest half tree in the state of Maine for oysters. Uh, a few years ago, he noticed that he couldn't grow his baby oysters as well as he had been in the past. And he started to investigate what the heck was going on. He found that it was acidifying waters uh, in his hatchery that were making it difficult for his larvae, oyster larvae, to settle. Uh, he made some calls to other shellfish growers around the U.S. on both coasts, and some of the same thing was happening there too. Whether it was larval sediment or brittle shells, the uh, impacts of ocean acidification were becoming apparent to the shellfish growers. So Bill, uh, Bill Mook, a number of other shellfish growers came to us and said, hey, we'd really like to get something together uh, to push and make our voices heard. We needed to be doing something more about climate. We want to go to Washington and organize, and we help them do just that at TNC. So we help these shellfish growers form the Shellfish Growers Climate Coalition. There's over 200 members in the U.S. that are pushing uh, and making their way to Washington to push for stronger climate action. And we think this is a really good vignette, right? Industry, the food, the farming sector can be advocates for climate action in the U.S. And it's not just the aquaculture sector, but there's a number of other uh, sectors that are being impacted now, and they want change to happen and occur. Uh, and finally, this is a picture of Laura Brown at Fox Point o Oysters in New Hampshire. I had an opportunity to visit her farm uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we waded the flats just like this in and around her farm. And during the visit, she pointed out to me like, oh, you know, uh, we have uh, a school striped bass that lives under these cages, and oh yeah, the, we often see, um, you know, the, the, the schooling and the breeding behavior of the uh, horseshoe crabs over here in the springtime, and you know what, this year, the water temperature has been a little bit warmer inside the bay than normal. Now, actually, you know, some of the wor warmest water temperatures they've seen up there in the Gulf of Maine, of Maine this year. And a kind of a light bulb went off for me. It's like, well, these guys are on the water day in and day out, whether it's the summer or the middle of winter, the shellfish farmers and aquaculturists and fishermen are there and they're observing these changes in real time. Uh, we need to be leveraging that. It's an untapped resource to help us understand how our oceans are changing. Um, I'll just close by saying we've got a lot of really cool stuff going on at the Nature Conservancy right now, uh, aquaculture and fisheries and otherwise. Um, it's been a great to have a chance to meet you guys today in person. Uh, I hope you can check out our website and we can stay in touch. So thank you so much.